All right, guys, welcome. My name is Kara Gallrap, and today uh, I'll be going through what's new in the WCAG 2.1. So I am a front-end developer at Message Agency, and I also oversee our web accessibility <laughs> initiatives there. So Message Agency, for those of you who don't know, is a full-service digital agency in Philadelphia. We're a certified B Corporation that works with nonprofits, universities, foundations, governments, and other missioned aligned for profits. Um, we're also a social enterprise that helps nonprofits use technology to enlighten, educate, engage, and enact change. So a little bit about me. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've worked primarily in the education technology space. In the past, I've developed digital literacy curriculum for students with learning disabilities and designed a learning platform that focused on adult literacy and English language learning. So with a personal mission to create an inclusive web, I'm an accessibility advocate and I'm here today to help you guys fight this good fight. So I'd like to give a little bit of an outline about what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, we'll start with a quick overview and then we'll go into who was the focus for the WCAG 2.1. Um, then we'll also talk about how does this affect me um, and then how long you have to get all of these new things and your sites up to speed. And then we'll actually go into the breakdowns and additions of what's new in the WCAG 2.1. So the first thing is the WCAG 2.1 is an extension of the WCAG 2.0. Um, it's also, uh, the WCAG 2.1 is also an official W3C recommendation. Um, so if, for those of you who don't know what a W3C recommendation is, it's basically a web standard. Um, and a web standard goes through a very rigorous process to become so. So we're not actually gonna go through this diagram, um, but I just wanted to give you guys an overview of what, you know, much like how a bill becomes a law, this is how something makes it into the WCAG. So it's a very rigorous process, um, and if you'd like to learn more about it, uh, there's, you can learn more about it on the W3 website. So also, um, real quick, um, the W, uh, WCAG 2.1 is backwards compatible, so if your content conforms to 2.1, it also conforms to 2.2. And in terms of structure, the WCAG 2.1 still follows the same levels of compliance, so level A, level AA, and level AAA. So also one thing to keep in mind is that in order to meet full page conformance requirements, that now includes um, all pages and all variances across breakpoints. So basically you have to make sure your mobile and tablet displays are just as accessible as your desktop views. So who was the focus when we were creating these new standards? So first it was folks with cognitive and learning disabilities. Also, people who have low vision, um, also uh, senior citizens were a big focus in this, and then also mobile device users. So how does this affect me, and how does this affect the organizations that we work for? So are you updating or are you updating your accessibility policies? So the W3C recommends that organizations adopt WCAG 2.1 when they are looking to update or create accessibility policies. Um, in addition, some organizations may require WCAG 2.1 conformance from third-party vendors. So for, these uh, for, so for these organizations, adherence to the WCAG 2.1 is critical to ensure compliance um, with their requirements. So next is, are you designing a site in the near future? So if you are, um, you really want to think about adopting these pol uh, the new uh, criterion sooner as opposed to later because things like um, the new non-text contrast, those will affect vi your visual designs. And then are you auditing a site? Um, so I like to think of audits as roadmaps, um, and I actually did my first audit against 2.1 recently, and it definitely takes a lot more time than, let's say, your typical audit, because you're testing things on different devices, different breakpoints, so it takes a lot more um, effort to go through these things. So, and since I like to think of these things as roadmaps, if you are thinking about either redesigning your site in the future or doing considerable development work, you're going to want to try to bake in these um, new success criterion when you're doing that. So how long do you have to actually bring all these things together? 
And it actually depends um, from, what, from what my research um, has told me. So at the time of this presentation, most laws like Section 508 and various international laws, they only require your site to be 2.0 compliant. But it could vary by state, sector, or institutions. Um, so for example, California's government website requirements indicate that vendors can use WCAG 2.0 or the latest version of WCAG. Also, um, since 3.0 or silver is due out in 2021, it's likely that we won't be seeing, you know, a lot of these laws change to, um, to incorporate 2.1, but these things will be in 3.0. So it's best to stay ahead of a, the curve and start familiarizing yourself with these new things sooner as opposed to later. All right, so now we are gonna get down into the breakdown and the additions to the WCAG 2.1. Uh, we have a lot to go over <laughs> since there were um, 17 new additions. So I've arranged these slides to go in order of their numbering with the exceptions of the additions to um, the AAA le um, level. I've added those at the end, um, so we'll go over them if we have time because I'd love to leave a lot of um, time for questions. But I'm, you know, but I'm happy to, if we don't have time for those, go over those new additions with you guys after this presentation. So the breakdown here is you can see that we have, um, for perceivable, we have seven new additions. For operable, we have nine. And then for robust, we have one new one. So the first one uh, is orientation, which is a level double, um, which is now level double A. So basically it says that sites can be used in both portrait and landscape orientations. Um, so we really need to, some users can't change or can't easily change the orientation of their web devices. So we should ensure that our sites can be used both in portrait and landscape orientations. Um, you know, especially for those who have their, um, their devices fixed on, in the fixed orientation. Um, you know, this success criterion um, also helps folks with low vision since changing the content's orientation also increases the text size. So the one exception to this would be it when a specific display orientation is essential. So in this case, the WCAG gives the example, if you um, have a banking app and then you go to take a picture of a check, since checks are, um, are horizontal, it's essential that you hold the app in and keep it in the landscape orientation. But the great news about this is, is lots of our, most of our sites now should have a responsive design and framework in it. So you're probably already meeting the success criterion. So the next one is identify input purpose, which is also a, a level AA. We should help browsers automatically fill out our forms. So when we use the HTML autocomplete attribute, we're helping those with either dexterity disabilities who have trouble typing, um, users with language, memory, and executive functioning related disabilities who may take more time to process information and the directions asked of them. And also literally anyone who hates filling out forms. And this is what that would look like in your HTML. So we, all we have to do is add the autocomplete feature, and then you can look online. Mozilla has a great guide for it of which autocomplete <coughs> attributes you can add to make your forms a lot more user-friendly. So the next is Reflow, another level AA edition. So content, this says that content can be presented without loss of information or functionality and without requiring scrolling in two dimensions for either vertical, con uh, vertical scrolling content at a width of equivalent to 32, um, uh, 320 pixels, uh, horizontal scrolling at a height equivalent to 256 pixels, and also, also users should be able to zoom in up to 400% on desktop browsers. So in layman's terms, your site and its elements must be responsive. The exception would be for anything that loses its meaning if it were to collapse into one column, uh, like a map. Um, this success criterion is a huge win for user experience and those with visual disabilities who need to, who need to zoom in to read content. So as you can see, this is a desk, uh, your desktop view. 
But then if you zoom into 400%, um, it just, uh, it collapses into the mobile view. So like, so, you know, much like the previous, uh, the previous one, if you're already using a responsive framework on your website, this really shouldn't be a big issue. So the next is non-text uh, non contrast, which is another level double A addition. Um, so your elements like buttons, icons, and infographics now have to meet your color contrast minimums. Uh, this includes the elements of focus states as well. And this could really impact, um, if there's any designers in here, this is probably what will impact your work the most. Um, Typically, when I'm working with designers, we've always had just like, oh, like make sure your like text has the right contrast. But now, even things when you're putting together stuff like infographics, those things also need to meet the color contrast minimums as well. So, so like this infographic here, it's really pretty and it's great, but it's very light. So if you were to have this on a website, you would really want to use darker colors like in this infographic here. So the next one is text, uh, text spacing. So users must be able to increase the line height, uh, spacing, following paragraphs, letter spacing, and word spacing without losing content or functionality. The WCAG says that all content and functionality must remain available and visible if a user were to change line height to at least one and a half the font size, space, uh, space below paragraphs to at least two times the font size, letter spacing to at least 0.12 the font size or word spacing to at least um, 0.16 the font size. And that can be a little hard to test for, um, but there, uh, this guy, Steve Faulkner, has a great um, text spacing bookmarklet that uh, can, on CodePen, that can do like a quick and dirty test for this. For instance, this is what a, um, a page that message agency developed looks like normally. But then when you're using the text spacing booklet, you can see how things change. And looks like all of my content doesn't lose any functionality. And that's fantastic. Um, I have this resource linked in this presentation that you'll be able to um, check out at the end of this. So next is uh, content on hover or focus, another uh, level double A edition. In recent years, a common trend on websites um, is to display a pop-up. Um, you can typically see this as uh, when you're going to like leave the tab and it asks you to sign up for their newsletter. Um, or also when you hover or tab onto like a certain part of the screen. If there are areas of your site that when new content appears, if a user hovers or tabs onto an element, you have to ensure that the content can be dismissed without removing their pointer or tab onto another element that the content will not disappear if the user um, moves their mouse over it, um, and the content will remain visible until the hover or focus trigger is removed, the user dismisses it, or the content is no longer valid. This lets users who increase the size of their mouse cursor or users who have low pointer accuracy see content unobscured um, and easily dismiss unintentionally triggered additional content. This also grants users who have cognitive disabilities adequate time to perceive additional content that appears on the screen. So our next is character key shortcuts, a level A edition. So as an ex um, so basically, if you have a keyboard, um, a one key keyboard shortcut, you have to have the ability um, on your site to be able to, that that shortcut can either be turned off, um, or the shortcut can be remapped to use one or more um, non printable ca uh, keyboard characters like a Control or Alt, um, and the shortcut is only active when the component has focus. So an example of this is if anyone works in JIRA, if you're going to log time onto a ticket, you can just hit the W and then your work log pops up. So I would need an additional, basically, I would need to be able to remap that, fun, um, that keyboard shortcut another way. So, and this is important because users who have permanent or temporary uh, dexterity limitations may be prone to accidentally hitting some keys. Um, 
And also having the ability to turn off these shortcuts or modify them to include another key would cut down on acid accidentally triggering shortcuts. Also speech users who also want these single key shortcuts turned off so that they can avoid accidentally firing um, like a batch of these uh, commands at once. So the next one is pointer gestures. If your, point, if your site uses multi-touch um, gestures to perform the same task, you need to make sure that you can perform the same task with the simpler gesture. So just like on our iPhones, if I see a picture, if I'm, if I'm on a picture, I can zoom in by either spreading my two fingers apart or double tapping. So this one, um, the next one is pointer cancellation. This is um, a really good one for anyone who's ever accidentally sent an email before, um, or if you've ever tried to like fill out a form or like when you're trying to send an email and you accidentally like click the button, you didn't mean to do that, so you try and drag it away, but it still sends anyways. So this sec uh, success criterion would definitely remove that anxiety inducing situation. So basically this says that down events can no longer um, be used to uh, complete a function. Down events are things like clicking or tapping or long pressing on. So um, you'll have, so basically if like, so for that button example, you should be able to, if you down press on something by either moving the cursor away or moving the focus away, that would cancel out any type of, um, inner, um, any type of like submission that that would trigger. The next one is label and name. Um, this success criterion is a huge win for speech input um, and text-to-speech users. Um, text that appears on a form control or image must match how the HTML identifies the form control or image. Uh, we do this through proper semantic HTML, using the label element, um, alt and aria labeled by attributes. Also, our visible labels must match its accessible name or, um, or pragmatic label. Uh, when we do this, these users can activate controls much easier. Um, when we don't do this, we create a frustrating experience for users when they say a visible text label, but the speech input doesn't, re uh, but doesn't work because the accessible name doesn't match. So let's say I am somebody who's using um, speech input. If I say buy, like I, you know, it'll be like, well, well buy what? So you would want to have something like, you know, instead of just buy, you know, buy teapot or, or buy coffee maker instead. Also, um, so the next one is motion actuation, which is a level A one. Basically, it, um, your site may let visitors use certain motions to perform a task, like, um, like if you shake your device, it will undo text that you've inputted, that you've just typed. Um, if your site makes use of motion gestures, you must provide a way to make the same functionality available for users who can't, won't, or don't want to perform motion gestures. You must also make sure that there's a way for users to turn off these motion controls so they don't accidentally trigger a response. So status messages, which is um, a level double A. There's lots of reasons why, user, um, why we alert users on the status of what they're doing. Sometimes it's because there's an error on a form that they filled out or that they've successful, um, you know, or that they successfully added an item to their cart. Um, sometimes it's to let them know that uh, where they are in a process, like a multi-step form. When we alert users of these things, we need to make sure that their, assist, their assistive technologies are alerted as well and that we're not interrupting the user by focusing them on another element or putting them on a new page. By using the appropriate ARIA roles for these messages, we can ensure all of those things. So <clears throat> we'll wanna use role status for results of an action like a successful form submission. We'd wanna use role alert or ARIA live assertive to identify errors like an, uh, like an incorrect value on a form. We also wanna use role progress bar to let users know where they are in a process. The next is identify purpose. Um, so our HTML um, should provide context, purpose, and meaning of symbols, regions, buttons, links, and fields. For example, uh, users who have a cognitive disability might find it difficult to concentrate if there are many sections on a, on a page. Um, 
If our site uses ARIA landmarks to identify regions on our pages, this user could use their assistive technology to hide all of the regions that weren't marked main. This goes hand in hand with the W3C's um, personalization uh, semantics, which is an exciting initiative in itself. Which base, uh, and they have a really great demo of this um, on their website. So let's say that this is our online clothing store. There's a lot going on there, but I might have um, I might have a program on my computer that allows me to hide certain things or to change the display of the actual website to make it easier for me to use. So if I launch that, it could then look like this, where the navigation is simplified um, and it's a lot more it's a lot more specific for the actions that I would want to do. So the next one is timeouts, which is um, a level is a level AAA. Um, if there is a timeout on any part of your site, you must either store the user's data for at least 20 hours or at the beginning of the process, warn the user that your site will have a timeout at, out of a specific time. So under this uh, success criterion, the WCAG makes a call out that I'll echo here. Um, so privacy regulations may require explicit user consent, yada, yada, yada. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I would recommend for this one, just call a lawyer. Um, there, might be, there might be certain things um, on your site that you might not know if it complies or not. So consult, so I would just consult a lawyer um, or you know, somebody in-house who's more familiar with that. And this is great for users with language, memory, um, and focus and attention related disabilities, as well as disabilities that affect executive functioning and decision making. Um, you know, these folks might need more time to complete tasks, um, and they may require taking breaks during those. So making sure that they know of these time maps is very important. So the next one is animations from interactions. Um, so motion animation um, triggered by interactions like uh, must be able to be disabled um, unless the animation is essential to the functionality or the information being uh, conveyed. So the WCAG gives the example that um, something like if you're using something that creates animations, um, that so just how it would preview there, you sh you can't disable that because that would you know, that would take away the point of the animation maker. Um, so that's okay, because that's essential. But things like uh, the parallax effect, or, you know, or if, uh, another popular trend is when you're scrolling on a website and all these SVGs and icons move, something like that should, um, you should really be able to disable that. Um, even though there is limited browser support um, at the time of this presentation, you could start using the prefers reduced motion media query, which looks, um, which looks something like this. And basically what it does is um, if you have this in there, certain devices will say, okay, this person does, um, you know, on the off chance this person on their device has this um, setting that says we do not want motion. Mm -hmm. It basically just disables it for them. Oh. So also just a quick note that um, the animations from interactions applies when the user's interaction initiates non-essential animation. Um, in contrast, the 2.2.2 <laughs> pause, stop, and hide um, applies when the web page initiates animation. So the next is target size. Um, I'm not sure, have you guys ever tried to tap on a forum button or close uh, a, you know, or hit the close icon on a modal uh, just to have your finger be too big to, uh, for the screen and for it to register as a tap. So we'll fear no more because now the target size criterion says that all interactive element should have at least a 44 pixel width and height to them. So the next one is concurrent input mechanisms. Um, our devices allow us to interact with them in a plethora of ways, um, especially when we use different accessories like a stylus or connect input devices like a keyboard to them. Websites should allow users to switch, um, to switch between these modalities. For example, if I'm filling out um, an application on your site through voice input, I should be able to turn off that feature and then use a keyboard or a mouse instead. Oop. Let's see. 
there's a whole lot more stuff here. Please hold. <laughs> So we've gone through a um, so we've gone through a decent amount of these. Um, I want to start talking about if anybody has any questions about what's new in the CAG 2.1. I'm, uh, I'm interested to know like what are the tools you use to audit the website? Uh, sure. Uh, what type of tools um, I use um, to either test these types of things or um, or when I'm auditing sites. So there is a lot of really great uh, free resources out there. Um, so some of the things that I use, um, uh, Google Chrome has a lot of accessibility developer tools that you can go in and use. Um, there's also the Wave uh, Chrome and Firefox extensions, which are really good. I'm also a really big fan of the um, the site improve widget uh, because when it's scanning a page, it breaks out the, um, you know, if, when you're failing something, it breaks it up by responsibility. So it's like, oh well, this is like the developer responsibility, or this is um, the, or this is like a content <laughs> author's responsibility. So things like that are really helpful. Um, there's also the text spacing bookmarklet, uh, which is really helpful. Um, you can also use. Um, I also have started using uh, the voiceover app um, for people who have Apple devices. There's a lot of accessibility features already baked into there. So if you're ever interested to um, see what a, um, what a person who is using a screen reader is using, you can, if you have a Mac computer, you can uh, launch the voiceover app and it's pretty insightful for, um, like, especially if you're a developer. You're like, oh, well, actually I have a, like, you know, as somebody who is, you know, if they're blind and they're going through this site, they're going through a lot of content or a lot of information that they just don't need to. So, so all of these are really good tools. Um, also, the, um, the WCAG has a great evaluation tool that I personally use when I'm going through an audit. Um, basically, what it does is um, you go to their website and then um, it breaks out all the steps. So you, you from everything from you know the purpose of your website to like you know main pages and then when you go like step by steps, it walks you through how to perform an audit. So the, that's a tool like that is really, really um, great to use, especially if you're not super familiar with doing audits. Yes. Um, I have a question, question specifically about the color contrast for all the things, mm -hmm. um, especially for the infographics. Um, sometimes that's coming from like a content author as an image and then it has text. So in your experience, do you have um, ways besides like education? Like is there a mechanism to prevent or throw an alert like around them uploading images that might not meet the standard? So, um, so I'll tackle that in two parts. Um, so the first is um, is definitely training whoever is putting that together that these are standards that uh, you know we need to meet. So you know training them on you know color contrast minimums and all of that stuff. Um, the second part is just like we have alt text for when we upload certain images. It's you know the short description there. Um, you can actually, one of the links I have here is uh, for like flowcharts and like concept maps and long descriptions. So basically it's a way to format the alt text in a way, um, it's basically a long description of the alt text because anything that you have on that infographic, you should, um, you know, obviously you need to make the text equivalent of that. And there are really great, um, you know, tools and examples out there to help you create those types of long descriptions. So even things like, um, like I've seen on whether it's, um, you know, employee, you know, focused websites or like HR um, websites where they're talking about like organizational structure and they show flow charts and stuff like that. So even your flow charts would go into things like this. You'd have to uh, write a like long description for, but you know, it is, um, but in terms of like having that, you know, meet the text con um, 
the non-text contrast. What I've done is, um, when I've worked with my designer, uh, he works in the, um, the program Sketch, if any of you guys are familiar, but it's basically an Adobe Illustrator, but also, um, you know, kind of like Photoshop. So that way I can go in and, you know, go and check those, uh, the contrast for that. I also know that there are a few Sketch plugins um, that you can get that, um, that, test, that actually like tests it. I personally haven't, I found it more complicated to use those plugins and a little, it takes a little bit longer to like structure the, um, the layers, right? So I, I just do it manually. Um, but in, you know, in terms of if there's a tool that I'm aware of that when you upload something that would scan it, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure, but I'm, but I'm confident that there is probably one out there. Um, I'm just, you know, at the time of this presentation, I'm, I have not encountered one of those. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yes. Uh, Maybe a little bit out of the bounds of this, but since we're asking questions, um, sort of along with the text or the text versions of long things, if you come across any really good, I work at a university and we have lots of PDFs that I have to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever, so we use Site Improve for sort of the, the actual web page part of everything. If you come across something that's a good tool <laughs> for auditing PDFs, uh -huh. Yeah, so, um, so the question was uh, if, if there's a good tool out there for, um, for auditing PDFs. Um, Adobe, the Acrobat, uh, actually does a pretty good job. Okay. Yeah, they actually do a pretty good job at that. Um, you can also, they're also on the WCAG website or the W3 website, I'm, I'm fairly confident there is a tool there that, um, that can scan your PDF. Uh, your scan your PDFs. Um, a lot of times, I mean, it's fa it's fairly good. Um, I've used one. It was like the number one Google, uh, you know, result for when I was like PDF accessibility checker. Um, some of them are, you know, riddled with ads, so you know, kind of like user beware. Um, but yeah, there are you know there are some tools out there that do it. Um, if you are a very PDF heavy um, organization, which you know, I'm assuming most organizations can be, um, what I would likely do is create a, uh, create a PDF template of sorts, run that through a, you know, run that through a checker, and then all PDFs moving forward use that template. So at least, you know, when you have time and you are auditing PDFs, you maybe can go back and fix certain things, but at least moving forward, the, um, the PDFs that you're creating, at least you know, are accessible. Great. Yeah, no problem. Doesn't that site improve also checks for accessibility for PDF files? It does, but it, it the way we're using it, it'll go through and say you have all these PDFs and these PDFs have problems, but then it doesn't really go in depth about what the problem. It'll just say that there's not labels. The PDF seems a lot more complicated to deal with. And, I mean, web pages are sort of like yeah. there's a code behind it. A, B, C, D, and you just you know update and stuff. Whereas PDFs are wild. And I would definitely recommend um, using a, uh, a screen reader or, like I said, if you have an Apple computer, using voiceover to listen to a PDF. Um, because sometimes um, I could get one and they're, you know, they're beautiful. You know, they have these like great cover pages and section pages and all of that. But then when you're actually listening to it, um, you know, there's no heading architecture. So it's like what is laid out, you know. And what if I'm looking at it visually, it makes sense. But if I, you know, but if I'm listening to it on a screen reader, you know, the contents all over the place just because of the way that it is structured. Or, you know, I've also found that sometimes people, if depending on like how styles are set up, you know, they're set up as like headings, but really they're paragraphs. So, um, you know, and these accessibility checkers, you know, they can scan for that. But if um, but I would also just recommend to using some type of like screen reader app to just to see what somebody, if they can't see the PDF, um, how they would interpret it. Uh, yes. I mean, I worked with accessibility for a few years. Like the biggest drawback about all these uh, tools 
is that like they scan probably like at the maximum like 73% of the guidelines. The rest, like 23%, has to be checked manually. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a process, like you know, like a list of what are the manual checks you need to do, like for a website? I mean, I know like, there are so many platforms now we need to check desktop, tablets, and mobiles. So, like any list, like to go through this. Um, so the question was, is there any type of list to um, that you can go through to know what is the ma is the the manual checks and what do you have to manually yeah, I mean, check? To follow the AA guidelines. Um, I don't have a I don't have like a, I don't have a list offhand, uh, but I do you know you know since you work in accessibility, you know that it's imperative that um, anytime you're auditing or, you know, checking a site's accessibility, there is, you know, a, like a program, a machine, an API, it can only tell you so much. Um, so you have to manually check certain things. Um, I mean, especially with a lot of these uh, 2.1 editions, you have to manually check them. Um, I don't, I have not encountered a tool yet that, um, that, does, ma that does automatically checks these things. Um, I'm sure they're rolling out with them, um, but a lot of them just require manual checking because even with stuff like uh, alt text, you know, the, a tool can tell you that you have alt text on an image, but it can't tell you if it's meaningful. So most of the time, like when I am auditing or checking for, you know, accessibility on a site, like even though it will tell me that, oh, okay, like I passed this, I always check like with the wave extension, it'll give you like the little icon and then you can jump into the source code where it is. I still always check that. Um, so if, if, you know, is there a list that requires manual checking? I personally don't use one um, just because I manually check everything um, or most things. So, but um, especially things like, uh, like tab order and focus order, something like that, you definitely have to manually check. So basically anything that has to do with like, I don't know, structure um, or interactions, I always know that I usually have to go in and manually check those things. But I mean like the point if you have, let's say a 500 page or a thousand page website, mm -hmm. right? and we know that the content editor uh, also, you know, uh, they can easily violate accessibility. I mean, how do you go so 500 pages to audit all this? Um, so what... Slowly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, also, too, if, like, you have, um, you know, how many types of pages do you have? Like, if, like for example, you know, if a site has a land, like, a landing page, um, listing pages, generic pages, you know, I will look for all these different types of pages or different types of components that I know are, like, reused on these 5,000 pages. Because you're right, there's, you know, having to go manually go through all of those, that is, that's an insane task and you know not really feasible or you know but when you have but when you can identify the um, different types of page structures um, and the different types of elements or components that are used throughout those uh, 500 5,000 pages and you can check those that and you know those patterns then you don't really have to check the all of the pages um, you know in terms of the con uh, content editors um, you know, I've seen some really atrocious things in the WYSIWYG and a lot of really horrible, like, you know, just atrocious violations. Um, but what you have to do is, one, there's, there's a decent amount of training that's involved in that. But also, um, you know, if you're a developer, locking down um, the WYSIWYG and um, if, you know, since we're at a Drupal camp, uh, I'll plug a great, uh, like, CK editor plugin. There's a great accessibility editor um, plugin that all you have to do is just a button that's on the toolbar and then it, you click it uh, as a content editor and then it highlights all the accessibility violations that's in that bo uh, that body content so that's a way it, you know because they have to have some ownership as well um, you know accessibility is everybody's responsibility so for the content editors it's you know it's training and they you know have to do their part as well uh, yes um, I just wanted to add on to that question. Um, if you want a tool that can actually sort a database and do deep set scanning, um, FAE, uh, the Functional Accessibility Evaluator by the School of Illinois, is, is an actual spider crawler um, for free. I think it goes through the first 100 pages. Uh, but if your company or your institution is willing to pay money, um, FAE does
Dunn's deeper crawls, uh, as well as uh, DQ World Space Complied, which is how I do my auditing for Rutgers University. Oh, awesome. I always love new tools, <laughs> so thank you for that. Yes. Um, for audits, I've also leveraged um, analytics to pick like the top ten or how much, however much time you have to go through the most visited pages and do like very thorough audits of those, and then like you were saying, go through like each type of page to get a broader scope of coverage. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely leverage your page visits and your analytics to know who's, you know, how many times people are visiting certain pages because you'll want to prioritize those, absolutely. Um, yeah. Site Improve does a good job of that. Yes. Because you could uh, activate the analytics and then you know which one is the uh, highest page ranked and you can uh, start tackling those high visited pages. Mm -hmm. And then also too, um, you know, when you're auditing a site, it doesn't always have to be this like big major lift where you're going through things. Um, I mean, initially it, it will be, but anytime if there's a, um, <clears throat> if you're do if you have like ongoing development work or if, um, you know, if there is a design change or basically, or any type of development change, you'll want to just scan whatever pages or whatever components that that affects. So that way you know that you're always staying up to compliance as well. More questions? Anything about web accessibility in general or? I have a quick one about mm -hmm. the text spacing, mm -hmm. line spacing. Can you just, was that a requirement that you're able to switch into that or, or in the design phase are we going to be required to have sort of this big spacing and <laughs> <laughs> that is, um, that's just basically the user needs to be able to change those things okay. if they want to. Um, so I would imagine if you, um, you know, if you're a developer, like front end person, uh, you know, and you put like the important on a uh, text property, um, that might, you know, I mean, using the important flag is really never a great practice, <laughs> but, um, you know, that might a user might not be able to switch that text property then. So you'll want to avoid certain things like that. But yeah, it doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, you like your letter spacing like for, uh, yeah, or anything mild like that. Uh, that would make, I'm sure, every designer's skin crawl. <laughs> yes. So I work with a, a lot of uh, very overly expensive agencies in the city and uh, we are get receive a lot of designs where I believe that they've never even anything like this. Do you have any suggestions on how to maybe sort of Jedi mind trick them into making sure that they're doing a little bit more before they hand over designs and not just focus on what might be pretty or the newest thing? Mm -hmm. You know, Parallax is everywhere, but never have they ever even spoke about, well, maybe we need to turn this off or disable it and things like that. Um, ex you should make accessibility a requirement, especially if you are, you know, you're working with agencies, um, you know, make that like, don't wait till like phase two or don't make it like an afterthought. You have to, you know, you have to manage the conversation and to make it a requirement. Um, so when you do get those designs, you can go back and say, hey, like, you know, I'm not sure about this text contrast or like, oh, like, have you, you know, wondered why um, or like, have you tested why you know it takes a mouse user one click to get to this page but it would take a keyboard user you know like seven tabs to get to the same thing um, you know so and it can be you know but also maybe work if you're if you're in the position to um, you know try to seek out certain agencies that make accessibility you know a requirement and have initiatives in that and also have experience with it um, Especially if you're working um, with an organization that might have like very, you know, like a, working in a very specific industry, maybe working with an agency that has experience working in that industry. Um, if you have in-house designers, it's just it all comes back to training and communication. Um, when 
our visual, uh, the visual designer at Message Agency, before um, you know, before he got here, he didn't have a lot of experience with web accessibility or like text contrast or any of that stuff. But you know, we just started making it a point, and now instead of you know. You know, him saying like, hey, like, is this like, does this meet these standards? He's already done, you know, some of like his due diligence. Um, and if there's like very specific things, like, you know, he comes to me about it. But it's, you know, it has to and you know, basic as like, you know, whether you're working with an outside agency or if you're like working in house, it's just everyone has to share the responsibility um, and which means you might have to have like a few conversation a uh, few hard conversations or you know sometimes like bully people into <laughs> thinking the way you think but you know if that's it's you know it's important um so you just have to you know make it a requirement so yes the other the other part of making it a requirement is also including some verbiage in there that the deliverable will be tested by an content auditing agency. That way, they're not saying, oh yeah, it passes double A for contrast, and you're saying, I don't think it passes double A. It doesn't matter, you're getting it from an independent third party. Here's the audit, it says you fail, fix this. Yeah, and that's what you're getting too. I mean, if you're yeah. just getting like mock ups or whatever, I, mean, I'm, I mean, I'm a product of being totally decoupled. So, you know, the business, the marketers at you know, unnamed large pharma company in New York City receives uh, these designs from WPP type agencies, all done and contracted with them. We get sort of a build kit where we have our high fives and everything like that that come over, and then that's kind of what we receive. So we're trying to move ourselves farther up the ladder with things like UX audits and accessibility audits to be earlier in the process, because like I said, a lot of these guys are looking at the, the flashy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and like, we're trying to explain, like, we're healthcare. <laughs> like, that's the one type of companies you cannot ignore these sorts of mm -hmm. things for flash. It's not a sneakers website, you know? Mm -hmm. like. And not saying that one should be more accessible than another, but like, come on, you know, we really have to focus on that for people and patients. You know, but even the, uh, going back to what you said about, about the sneakers website, I mean, Domino's and Beyonce were sued uh, for web accessibility and web accessibility lawsuits, so no one's safe. So, <laughs> so even if, if you're like a hospital or you know, if you're a e-commerce site, it you know, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, so because you're, we're public accommodations, if you know, if you had a, if you had like a physical store, you know, you wouldn't tell somebody in a wheelchair like you can't come in here, or a blind person you can't come in here. So we can't do that online. Um, but but yeah, definitely, may, I would definitely make it a requirement and make it clear up front, like I, uh, you know, this needs to be tested, or you know, like you suggested, like have it audited by an outside company. What if you, the threat of that. So just let you know when the designs come in, we will be auditing it for accessibility and you know up to at least of this measure. So yeah, just don't even waste your time sending anything over that's not. Yeah. That should be in your SOW or project agreement or whatever you're using. That the deliverable must pass the CAG. Yeah. Signed by the lawyer. <laughs> yeah. So we have a lot of lawyers. You know, and um, and also too, I. Uh, and I would definitely, when you're um, when you're getting these contracts and you are working with an agency, tell them you want it to be 2.1 compliant, not 2.0. Um, especially if you're designing for a site that's going to be around, you want to be around for like you know five to ten years, something like that, um, because. All of these 2.1 editions will be in 3.0, which will be um, arriving in, I think it's 2020. Um, so you'll just get ahead of the curve and it will be less work that you then have to do later on. So I would make it clear to, um, especially if you're developing um, new sites or, you know, or if you're designing new sites, to get the 2.1 baked in right away. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Um, so this is maybe more mundane and basic question, but you talk about the interactive elements have to be a certain size, 44 square. Um, how does that? How does that? 
does that apply to form element, like native browser elements as well? And whose responsibility is that in, in the sort of stack? Uh, so it is a, um, it is level AAA. So a lot of, you know, very rarely, I think uh, sites need to uh, be level uh, AAA. But I mean, it's just good UX in general for, you know, people who have like larger fingers. But yeah, it would be, um, you know, form elements, buttons, input fields. Um, and it would be on the design, if you're getting mockups, um, it would be on the designer's responsibility, but then also as a developer, you know, just check the, you know, width and height of it. It would be a minimum of 44 uh, pixels high and then minimum width. It's like, I, I just think about like check boxes and radio buttons and what a nightmare those are on mobile. Even, you know, I don't consider myself have large fingers, but I cannot <laughs> hit, like it must be 10 pixels square. Yeah, or even just like the focus area of it. So even if like, let's say like the um, the checkbox is not, um, you know, is not 44 by 44, the tappable area would be. So, um, and you guys might have like run into it. You're able to like click on like the label of it. And then, you know, that's what also, that's what makes it the active state. So something like that so as that well. Counts. Yeah, so that, I would imagine that counting, yeah. And just based on Uh, you mentioned the W3C tool, accessibility tool that you like so much. Can you show us the link? The, um, the auditor one? Yeah. Let's see what happens when I click this link where it launches. <laughs> Here we go. Do, do, do. So this is really cool. <laughs> I love using this thing, um, especially when I was first uh, started auditing. I definitely used this to uh, help me ramp up, and you know, it helps me give like a tree of like what to look for. So you can just like define the scope. Here you can um, hit your conformance target, explore website. So you can even uh, even like like I would like check like what technologies are relied upon. Um, you know, it gives you some additional area to, to like variety of web, uh, web page types, essential functionality of the website. And then in here, um, let's see, yeah. select a representative sample. So you can, like here, you can put the um, website URLs here so that when, and you'll see in like the next step. So if I put just for lack of a better URL, So, search page, and then you can put a randomly selected sample there. So then when you go to audit, so you can go and here's like the non-text-like content. So here's like all the different types. And then you can say like not checked, passed, failed, not present, cannot tell, add some notes in here. And it like breaks it up too. So since I put that I'm trying to target um, level AA, um, I'm not going to see anything for level AAA. And then, yeah, it goes through all of these guys. So, and then if you're not sure exactly what it is, you can um, click this button and then you can see the criterion text, which is really helpful. And then if you want more information, you can go to the understanding then how to meet links right on the site. And then in the next step, this is like the report findings, executive summary, all of that stuff. Here are the thing, all the things that we just went through and checked out on our website. And then I think the view report's the last step where I can just download it all. Um, so it's a really easy way to <clears throat> go through a site, um, especially if you're not super familiar with how to audit a site. It just gives you like a really good structure on how to do it um, and a process if you don't have your own. So I recommend this one as an evaluation tool. Any more questions? Well, then class dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>